Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Ah, I hope you're having a good day. Uh, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Today on the podcast, I was very lucky to have James Roberts. He is, he has represented the United Kingdom uh, four times at the World Championships, as well as uh, two times at uh, the uh, two times at the Paralympics as well. It was very interesting to uh, speak to him. He is also uh, the host of a podcast called uh, The Mindset of an Athlete uh, Podcast. It was very interesting talking to him, uh, very insightful. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the show. Have a great day. And yeah, let me know what you think. And please subscribe. <laughs> no problem. Peace. Ah, hello my friends, hello my life warriors, wherever you are in the world, I do hope you're having a good day. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo, this is episode 81. Ah, 81. Ah, I remember that, yeah. But anyway, I've got to say, uh, very, very privileged to have today on the podcast, James Roberts. I've got to say, we've been trying to get this together for a good couple of weeks now, but I've got, this is the thing, like this guy, uh, you know, there are people out there who go and decide to go, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go into sports or something like this. But when you go to like four world championships representing the great, like Great Britain and two Paralympics, you kind of like go, okay, I'm quite humbled. But yeah, doing a number of sports as well, which we'll get into. But let me say, hey, James, how are you today? Very well, Miwa. Thanks again for the introduction and thanks again for obviously your patience this morning. <laughs> uh, don't worry, it's Friday. It's Friday. Look, in my near future, I can see... Mm, I can sense some type, a top of like halo top coming my way, but that's another story. <laughs> so yes, good times, uh, much uh, relaxation, hopefully will be coming in this weekend. But yeah, uh, one of the things like I'm bringing you on today. Yeah, you are like, you are someone who I got to say is very busy. Like after like you're doing I did the four world championships, like Paralympics. Yeah, you decided to do yourself a little podcast as well. What's that all about? Uh, well, that's actually a good question. Um, I, I initially did it for more to be an ex expansion of the business. And after a, after a while, I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, and it's not been that forceful of um trying to sell anything it's it's very much a recommendation to people listening week in week out to mm -hmm. come and check out check me out come and check out my resources and ultimately most of those are free and that's your choice whether or not you take them or not uh and there's no hard sell and i've kind of gone completely the other way where it's trying to actually probably give something back in, in, in value be it um an opportunity for people to have like a chit chat listen to a chit chat between me and a fellow athlete and ultimately i want to hold no prisoners prisoners when it comes to that because i have heard the mundane questions from journalists that they will get i'll go a step further and i'll go a little bit deeper and, and i'll probably give the people the raw stuff the mm. stuff that is maybe contro controversial uh, confrontational uh, and then the same with uh, fellow coaches, be it in sport or academia or even the profession. It's like, OK, let's let's dispel some of the myths that are out there. Uh, let's go a little bit in depth, both scientifically, but it is in layman's terms that people can understand and then go from there. So it, it's, it's utilizing probably every box that I've been in, mm. be it sports, academia, disability uh i've even bring, brought up race issue recently that's it's not come out yet but we 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 did i, I did speak to a, a visually impaired uh, black, um, african-american athlete and kind of bring that up in a un pc way in terms of okay you as a blind person how do you see color and ultimately i won't give much away because obviously that can wet the story but be it obviously 
he doesn't really hold any prejudice because ultimately he's going to base it on somebody's voice and more their morals and their character versus you and I that might make a presumption straight away oh you you comport yourself this way oh, you're either prejudiced racist sexist by an action that you've done and we've not maybe taken the time to get to know that individual we made a gut reaction mm, no I don't like you mm. no that is interesting yeah a blind person, they've been blind all their life, and go, yes, <laughs> you're like, you're a black person, you're a white person. Ah, you're ch- what does that mean to them? <laughs> it's like, I, yeah, that, that is kind of strange. You're just like, um, yeah, <laughs> just people to me. So, yeah. So, right. So, how long have you been, like, you say you've got, like, you've been running it alongside your business. How, so, how long have you been running the podcast for? This uh, this episode, this this form of the podcast, not episode, has been running for about three and a half years. But I did run one previous to that that was only on YouTube. So I've been in the podcast space for about five years. Mm. So you've been in the podcast space for five years. So what have been some of the ups, downs, like the craziness or like, yeah, or the fun times? I'll see what you mentioned before we start recording, you know, that trying to do it week in week out trying to get guests mm. um i was supposed to record one as of yesterday but obviously life gets in the way mm-hmm. as it will do with what we're living in at the moment uh, i can appreciate that probably a little bit more i'm a little bit sympathetic that things are going to come out of the blue more suddenly um yes we've tried to reschedule it a number of times we'll get there in the end we'll get so, but very much like you I've got them in the bank. It's it's not it's none of this. Uh, living from week to week, mm. even like I li- I work within an industry that operates like that. It's very, it's not week to week, but it's month to month, uh, which is a little bit barbaric. Uh, why somebody is a self employed would want to do that in like, like kind of operate in like uh, an extreme uncertainty when you can have a little bit of control and ultimately, like you you said. Miwa, of if you do the work and you kind of be a little bit more pragmatic and proactive and get things stored uh, as, I'll use money terms, you know, like it's savings aspect and, and you've, you, you, you've already got one or two and some, mm-hmm. you're, sitting, you're sitting pretty for a few weeks, a few months. Uh, I was on a show last week she's got up until christmas so i'm i i'm i was more than okay with going on and it'd be at the back end of the year yours you were saying to me it'd be october that's fine and it's looking at more of it as from a business sense it's evergreen because ultimately unless you deem to take it down it's not going anywhere and looking at looking at it more from obviously what we talked about with um, Electric Mountain, you know, innovation, it's its using kind of more of, you know, things that are outside the box. It's like, okay, how can I get myself in multiple places all at once? Mm. Go on podcasting, um, write a external blog for somebody, ultimately, um, I do less of that because that's more difficult. Whereas speaking for most people, it's not. It's it's conversational. Mm. It should be fairly easy. Yes, it can be in in, in I can't speak intimidating at times to do public speaking, but I think you make me very at ease. I've done loads of these, and I do my own show weekly. So speaking for me is not that. It's it's become easier it wasn't as easy in the, back in the day five years ago uh, i recently had um it's not the most recent one the one the week before uh i'd had on previously on my very first show and i thought it was the because i rebranded the, the mindset athlete that i now uh, host and i thought he'd already been on this one but he hadn't been on the other one so i i was toying with the idea well do i share what it was like five years ago when he came on or don't i i might as well because then people can see the progression from 
obviously that it's night and day mm. the evolution and, 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 and i think it gives you know like for the newcomers well you don't have to strive for perfection like the big you know like the big hitters the big boys have got actually from money behind the shows yeah no i think anything where you can see sort of progression is always a good thing because like if you think about like damn like let for example like um tim ferris or basically joe rogan like if you like like joe rogan might be a slightly different beast because this whole thing because he's done fair factor so he was doing all these interviews back in the day so you know what i mean that sort of thing coming on but seeing sort of early episodes of their podcasts sort of like oh wow um it you see how rough around the edges even like someone like joe rogan who's had all of that sort of interview time it's still like oh wow your show was very much different and like how the sort of polish has come along and like with yourself uh doing podcasting for five years like yeah you think about you think about the first ever podcast you ever did and like you think about yeah like your latest one oh my god but put it this way i remember the first podcast i did remotely like ah that was that was an education and a half to say the least like i was like i i was using skype and obs to do this all and like let me just say yeah getting skype to work on a call easy getting skype to work doing a recording depending can be tricky and if you're doing it through obs you're just throwing a next level of complexity into there so yeah everything i had it set up everything was working everything was going smooth and yeah then uh liam came on and i was like yeah tried doing it and everything just went see ya i was like oh, okay couldn't get it to recall can to do this i was like I'm like a cold sweat going down my back. And like, I was like, yeah, this, this is not looking like the most professional thing in the world. Thankfully, for my sake, Liam did podcasts as well. So he did everything over Zoom. And then basically it was like, yeah, like I tried doing this. Look, I tried doing it over Skype a couple more times. And then I was like, yeah, I can't be doing this. It's going to drive me insane. And that's where I discovered the magical world of doing it over Zoom. And I was like, yes, that's it. This is the way it is. But no, like basically from that point until right now, and I haven't been doing this for a long time myself, like next month will be a year. Uh, there's a like severe change. So like with yourself over like doing the podcast, which you had a guest on like back in, like back when you were fresh face and podcast innocent, to bringing them on now hey damn right uh like i think you should do that again i think you should do it more times because yeah that's like hey you remember me like, oh yeah it's like yeah it's me james <laughs> come i don't know well, do you think you'll do that well, in terms of people coming back yeah, i think i think if they've had a good experience i think they're more they're well they're well inclined to come back on again uh ultimately I, I don't do a lot of the leg work anymore. I, I'll, I'll ask, well, who, who do you have in mind? Who do you think would be a good fit for my show within your network? So, mm. so I'll just ask the question sometimes. Um, and most, most of the people, even like recently, I'll keep in touch. And we're talking about um, NFL, play, NFL rookies and, and, and one, he's not been on the show yet. He was in the NFL for about five, six years. Mm. Um, these, these are they're not big 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 names but ultimately to make it to the professional ranks in the u.s it's no easy task oh, so just to have people within that network that you can have a conversation with you know like day to day, day to day just in passing on while well, you I'll, I'll speak to my on instagram or linkedin uh, and be it uh, i've wrote notes down well we didn't ask this question no let me ask it you on social media and obviously it will impact you know uh probably i don't know maybe a big greater audience than the show uh, would be able to do and, and then do that and it, it, it is the, the the one in question that i recently spoke to he's uh within gary vanderchuk's um sporting agency so it's not a it's not a bad um 
connection to have. Um, ultimately, I've not tagged either himself or the sporting agency to check out his show. Uh, I, I, I let the, the athlete himself. He shared it twice. Uh, he shared it on LinkedIn himself. Uh, and, his, and his journey to, obviously, the NFL is very, very different to probably most of them because he'd come from uh, being a West African boy uh, living in um, the Congo, then moved to Togo, and then the US have a, a immigration policy where they bring people from war-torn countries over. So he, he grew, he brought up in Texas, never seen American football before. Obviously, he was very much uh, he knew of the round game. Um, and what's this stupid game that I'm watching on TV? So that was as as raw as you can get because yeah. ultimately uh, I did my homework. Um, I saw obviously the quote that he got from Gary Vee himself. That's at the very beginning of the show. And he talked about uh, being very much the person that consumed his content from being a sophomore in college all the way through. So when it came time signing to an agency, for him, it was a done deal. Mm. If you guys are coming to me, where do I sign? And, and be it because he knows um, what Gary Vee stands for, and he can see that very much uh, synergy. I was trying to think of the best word to use. Yeah. Um, that ultimately he's not going to be taken advantage of. And it's like probably, probably this is my words now it's paraphrasing probably like a member extended member of his family yeah no but that's the power of having like building a good brand and having a great presence on the web which it like we all know that is like it's easier said than done uh to say the least but yeah like being able to talk to someone like that of that sort of caliber like i've got to say most probably it's going to be quite easy, like, interesting to see how he sort of came like came up from like yeah coming all the way from west africa like and then basically being in a high school where it's like there you go play like it's we're gonna play football okay why is everyone wearing pads that makes no sense to me then like going into the college system because like yeah you know especially if he's in texas because texas you're a superstar when you're playing american football like getting into college, you're still a superstar, and then it can it gets then if you really make it, well, then again, when I say really make it, if you're made it in college, that's really making it in some respects, even in high school in Texas. But yeah, the come up must be like, oh, must be quite a story. But yeah, but talking about the come up, here's the thing. Now you like Okay, four world championships, two Paralymp like appearing in two Paralympics. How did like how did you get started yourself? Because look, it's it's one of those things where you guys go, right. Four world championships, which is an achievement in itself, two Paralympics, which is still an achievement in itself. I the way I see the Olympics and the Paralympics, it's where you guys get together every four years, uh, like the fittest people in the world and then you decide the fate of the rest of mankind that's all i see <laughs> like, we shall in some way one way to look at it <laughs> <It's> like, mm, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> yeah so how did you get started oh that's a good one me well um for me um i started off in able-bodied sports back as an 11 year old in swimming but prior to that i kind of delved myself into martial arts I uh, was a bit of a naughty boy um, and it's quite it's quite difficult to say this because it's it's a, you have to be disciplined to do martial arts but mm. obviously I was messing about um, and, and then I went into because I brought up on an international base and the Americans had somewhat of an influence which sport I did temp in bowling uh, so to give some context but the Americans would know you could probably get a scholarship to do that at, at, at university the brits wouldn't know that um because it's virtually the sport in itself mm. you got the professional ranks of i think occasionally it'll be on eurosport or something like that uh, and you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars for throwing a ball down on a lane 
But obviously we digress and ultimately uh, I started as an 11-year-old in swimming, uh, progressed through my ranks and it was one of my coaches when I was in high school kind of said, well, what's your take on doing disability sport? Okay. It's not very good, but I'll hear what you've got to say. And ultimately I was taken aback by the comment and I think because I was that, I wasn't that rebellious as a teenager, but I think with that comment, it's like, well, who are you to say that I can't compete against everybody, which I could, but within reason. Mm. I, I know the league I was in wasn't that strong, um, and that's no disregard to it, but that's just fact. And ultimately, I ran with it uh, within the space of about probably 12 to 18 months. I'd made our uh, uh, British Swimming what is now a development program back then it was called the potential program um and kind of had the meteoric rise from that but i think what was kind of the guiding light to me to make it over here because i was living in belgium at that time with more of the work of the nato it was the springboard for starting my career as a spectator um Obviously, I live, as you know, in, in Wales now. Um, my grandma's actually English. But my mother was kind of told in no uncertain terms by her. I've got no memory of this, even though it's only 20, 18 years ago. Um, you need to kind of get James on the path to success in sport. And ultimately, my mom took it upon herself to, when the session had finished, shout over the balcony, which I was very embarrassed about at the time as a 15, 16-year-old. Uh, can can I speak to a Welsh personal delegate to talk about my son progressing in 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 in, in the sporting ranks of, at that time swimming? Uh, obviously, the head coach came over, came to speak to us. Ultimately, said to me, "Well, you starting at eleven years old is probably too late because uh, normally people start about six, seven, probably eight at the latest." Well, obviously, I went away with that. Okay, I'm going to prove you wrong, but. Ultimately, this coach, he's no longer with us, but he dined, in, dined on that for afternoon, after dinner speeches. My story of my mom doing that, going out of her way to put me in a position to succeed. And ultimately, I had to do the work to then do it. But it kind of shows an outsider's perspective as you don't have to follow the, the, the conventional route. Mm. I did it a different way and it still can be done from an inspirational, motivational uh, point of view. And ultimately, it's kind of always been, when I've been told, no, okay, watch me. Uh, and it happened with my first World Championships in 2006. They said, don't worry about 2006, James. Worry about 2007. No, no. I want to compete in 2006. And I said that to my performance director, who uh, I've only recently got back in touch with after about a decade, which I feel bad, quite bad because he's almost like an extension of my family. Uh, and as my mum will say, I see him more as an uncle than a performance director because that, that relationship was that close. He would probably bend over backwards um, to put me in a position to succeed. Uh, anything that I needed they would be there for, he would be there more specifically for me so that as a as a as a relationship that's not really um an athlete and a director that's more i think within wales because we are so small and we punch above our weight but above our weight should i say in disability sport more specifically we are very much like a family i i still keep in touch with even though they weren't in the same discipline in sport I still keep in touch with all the guys, even though I've retired. It, be it some have come out of retirement and one in particular, he's done two summer games and a winter games. He's got himself into the cross-country skiing team uh, with the eye of, um, which is the next winter games, Beijing, but I can't remember what the date is. I think it's 2022. But whether or not that is delayed because of Tokyo being a, a, a year later, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, and ultimately, I, I'm, I've been in and around performer athletes for a long time. Mm. 
when I didn't have a Paralympics to my name, oh, I want to be in the same, uh, how would I put this? Conversation as you that has, okay, that individual, but at that time it was only one, he'd only been to one. Oh, I, want, I want this. I want this uh, accolade associated to my name because ultimately uh, when you speak to any disabled athlete coming up, that's their aspiration. I want to be a Paralympian. Where, whereas from the, probably the outside looking in, an able-bodied person can't see the difference between well, what's the difference between a disabled athlete and a Paralympian. It's a big thing. A big thing because that is once you are one, it stays with you. So when put people put X Paralympian, well, I'm not X anything because that that is a reputed rec recognition that you're going to get. You're in a selective group of i don't know say a few thousand athletes every four years as you put it and then you've got the ones that are above that the, the olympic medalists or the paralympic medalists ultimately i'm not in that group of individuals but i'm okay with that now um i've had them uh our alumni magazine through uh from swansea university um and i'll give you the the the, the group the, the grits of it because ultimately i did this and i was a bit embarrassed I got annoyed because I wasn't in it, but it didn't look properly. Uh, and I was speaking to one of my old university lecturers yesterday. She said, oh, I've had it through the press. You're in it. Oh, okay. And then a classmate said it as well. I was like, oh, I feel really bad now. Why, why did I get irritated for no reason? Uh, and I, I looked at that page, but I didn't look at the bottom. And, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, as one of the sporting people, I'm near the front. So I don't know if it's that because I've done more to promote the university on social media mm. i'm very much proud to be at the forefront of it be it you know anything uh facebook reminds me of you know 10 years ago well back in july it would have been 10 years since i graduated from you so had that on it on on twitter tag the minute mm. it could come down to something sim simplistic as i'm going out my way to showcase an institution that i went to for only five years to my audience ultimately it's, whether or not they go to that university is a different story but i'm not going to say uh you have to go to that institution ultimately we, ultimately we don't live in a society in the uk that's very like um the us because i was watching an hbo documentary on sky this week about obviously bribery in college basketball we don't obviously have that problem because uh, most of the individuals that are going to go to university that are in sport are already professional because they ultimately they're getting paid by their governing bodies anyway mm -hmm. so this amateur amateur amateuristic state that the american talk about it doesn't exist um the olympics it doesn't exist it's a commercial entity and everybody is getting paid in some way be it the coaches the athletes uh the sponsors are there at the forefront because they want to get you know the back end people see their product on the tv mm -hmm. uh, i want to buy that ultimate coca-cola or mcdonald's doesn't really have to do that because they are be institutionally into people's psyche or oh, coca-cola drink mcdonald's eat ultimately from a sports person perspective it's very uh, ironic that those two brands are associated with being unhealthy yeah but and you're associating something that's the pinnacle of of health yeah because like here's the thing uh with when you say mcdonald's and coca-cola uh one of the things which like come like immediately jumps to mind is Usain Bolt's like first Olympic oh your chicken nugget story yeah the, yeah the, yeah precisely the chicken nuggets <laughs> just like yeah I uh, got up yeah got some chicken nuggets and yeah you know what ran the 100 meters and made it look simple you're like um, <laughs> you hear that you're like oh, chick, chicken nuggets the, the nutritionist the nutrition meal you need to win a medal <laughs> That's like, yeah, but when, like, but um, even in 2012, they did have, I believe they had a McDonald's restaurant for the athletes in the village, didn't they? And yeah, 
I think that's been a running theme for the last Olympics. Uh, well, I think it's ever. I think it's because I've been to two, so be a bit earlier than Beijing. I don't know. This is something that obviously is free for the athletes, whereas um, I think they for London 2012 they made, they actually created the biggest McDonald's in the Olympic Park uh, that had ever been seen. Um, I didn't go into it, or, or uh, there's no necessity for that. But we are told as British athletes, no, you don't you don't go to McDonald's until mm. you've finished, and ultimately then it's a choice uh, whether or not you have it or not. Um, whereas you'll see the developing countries, be it the African nations, South Americans, go there every single day for their breakfast, lunch, dinner. Not ultimately, not maybe every not every meal, but at least yeah. they're like accused of deep. What's wrong with the rest of the food that's in the food court? Um, I was very much, uh, I, I'm quite an open minded person anyway, because I've been brought up with food. It, it we try something at least once. So, um, like I think the uh, American station, um, uh, Caribbean and, and, and African station, uh, Asian. And then the rest of Europe. So, well, British food in Europe, I can have any day of the week. I can wait till I get home to have that. Uh, pizza or, or American food, it, it, uh, I'm not really that fussed. I can have it any time. And because, well, before the games, I was dating somebody uh, who was um, family from Jamaica. I got to like plantain. It's like, well, okay, let me experiment with. African meal, like meals and and and, and Caribbean food because, well, once I come home, Bob being able to go to a big city, I'm not gonna be able to eat these sorts of food. So let me try and not experiment, but let let me kind of expand my palate. Right. And I know what plantain tastes like. I had a few a few of my teammates say, "Well, what what is what is that you've got on your plate?" It's like well, it's 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 quite hard to describe. It looks like a banana, but it do, it doesn't taste like a banana. And some people try it, it's like I don't like this, but ultimately it's probably an acquired taste. Well, Maybe less so for the Africans or the the Caribbean folk because they probably grew up with eating it. And I I quite liked it. Um, I, it's this conversation I had with my mom. She she liked it when she tried it. Um, uh, before I was born, so, so it's. I think it gave me a sense of well, let's try different yeah. recipes. I don't have to cook them, which is a bonus, uh, and ultimately enjoy the experience of having something new. I probably put on a few pounds, but and I look at the pictures back now. I was like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably ate a little bit too much, but meanwhile, I'll give you a little bit further. Where we were supposed to be, where our, our GB house was, yeah, originally was supposed to be closer to the food hall because they were going to give us the biggest building, which is being the home games. Yeah, the obviously the Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee declined because, like, well, we're not going to give the athletes the incentive to. Well, if I wanted to get just a quick bite to eat, I only got to walk five minutes to the food hall. So they picked the one that was the furthest away from the food hall as possible. And it was like look, overlooking the park. So as probably uh, memory serves, it was good. You could, I, I, uh, we had like the top, one of the top, the probably penthouses now. Yeah. Overlooking the park. So we could see the, we didn't go to the opening center, but you could see the fireworks going off for the Olympics, Olympic Stadium. But you probably have an eye line with the fireworks themselves. And if you were kind of feeling peckish, well, do I really want to walk 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes for food? Uh, nah, not really. And I don't really need it. Yeah. And the Americans had it in the end. So they had that block. They were saying, oh, you guys pass it over. Like, well, I can see why they did it because it takes out that aspect of convenience where yeah. people would have had it during lockdown. Oh, I'll just walk from where I'm working into the kitchen. I think they're uh, just trying to keep your eye on the prize. It's like, get the food, look at yeah. the stadium, get that medal. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> I can see that being a thing. So basically, like, so in the village, like, because something was, I was like, like they did, I, for a moment there, I was like, did they serve 
all this food in one McDonald's. But I imagine it was like a big giant food court. Where it's, a ma- it's a massive, um, not a gazebo. Um, like you, you think of a marquee for uh, for a wedding reception. Oh yeah. Probably multiply that by, I don't know, ten. And that's that's what you got for a food court for. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of the numbers. I know the Olympics would be more, because obviously they've got to do that. Mm. Uh, probably say te- I'm going to put a rough figure about ten thousand athletes for three meals a day. So There's a lot of people coming through there, eating a lot of waste. Um, so it's probably like a military operation behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, so what events were you in for for the Paralympics? I competed in my first games in Beijing in rowing and yeah. that was the first time that sport had competed at the Paralympics. Uh, so I think it brings a lot of sense of accomplishment because not only was our first, first, my first games, the first games of the sport, but obviously to make the final as well you're kind of laying the foundations what for what the program goes on from a legacy perspective. And uh, I was one of the first people to congratulate uh, the crew that was in my category uh, when they won in Rio. Very difficult to do it because it's like, well, if this person had only been there eight years prior, I might have got a medal. But obviously I had to take a reflective moment to kind of, well, that's not realistic. She would have been eight years old at that time not 18 12 sorry uh, at that time not the athlete that she is now uh, and I obviously congratulated them for for winning the gold medal uh, it was difficult to watch the Rio games uh, in the in in the build-up because like we said I know a lot of athletes so mm. I see behind the scenes so it was like well four years ago you'd have been in London Eight years ago, you'd have been in, in Beijing. You'd have been there. So it was quite surreal looking at it. It's like, but then I did take a moment to step back. Well, James, you're looking at the icing on the cake. You also know how it takes to build the cake. So you've got to take it. Yes, you want to have the, you want to have the cake and eat it. And you want the easy stuff and, I get, and then get in the tracksuit and all that. But you also know all the, the hardship and the sacrifice that goes with it, that you've you've got to miss people's birthdays. You've got to miss, well, I competed most years on my birthday. So for me, uh, when people kind of ask, well, do you want to take that day off? Well, I haven't done it in the past, so why stop now? Yeah. Uh, I think I did, I think maybe one year I, I didn't train in the or say 20 years that I've, I've taken it off, um, possibly two at the most. So it'd be either competing or training, and I thought nothing of it. It's like, okay, versus not going anywhere, I'll celebrate it in the evening. Uh, and, and like that. So this this year, obviously, I've been in lockdown was weird because people asked, well, what did you do? I went for a daily walk and had some cake. Well, the cake is probably the only thing that is exciting of, of the day because it was something different because it's something that I wouldn't normally have done uh, previously. Mm. Now, one of the things, like you mentioned, yeah, like where, like, see, like seeing like Rio, like you, like you saw the behind the scenes, so you know their sort of work and effort, what goes into getting there. So what was like your sort of day uh, to be uh, because you're an like you're an elite athlete, so like the whole thing is, what did that sort of day look like? Typically, Oof. we go for you, if I use rowing as the example because it's the easiest one to remember. You're talking up in the lead up to that games, a thirty hour week, so it's virtually a job. Uh, mm-hmm. It will comprise. Uh, three strength and conditioning sessions a week. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, I think think Monday and Friday were more strength-based. And then the one that I I don't miss whatsoever, and I was talking about to another strength and conditioning coach about, uh, was we had to do a circuit. and And it is brutal when you start out because it's based on your one rep max, be it on the 
bench press and the bench pull. And then you have to do it six rounds of 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off of six exercises. And I think you get about two minutes rest between each. And I think the last time I did it, I worked that hard. I could be sick. So you can see what kind of, uh, and I don't know. I think it's because it's a process. You don't, you think nothing of it. It's like, well, I'm, I don't have to push myself to those extremes. Yeah. Uh, I think, and if we go way back, I think because my mom used to say, well, if you'd have put the same dedication you did in rowing us, uh, if you'd have put the same dedication that you, you could have done in swimming that you had done in rowing, you'd be more successful in, in swimming. But obviously that is very hypothetical. Uh, I would disagree a little bit. But I think when she saw me train uh, one of my sessions when we were in, in, uh, in, in South Wales uh, at the, the Welsh Institute of Sport, mm. I went green. And as a, as somebody that's okay, you can't see me on podcast, but I mix race. When somebody that's not white goes green, yeah, you know they're putting some work in. So I think my mom could see that there were effort, and to a certain extent, sacrifice I'm willing to put on my body because mm. I went like you know from a shade of brown, to <laughs> shade of white to the, then I, I I I couldn't see my face to, to somewhat of green, and then obviously had to be sick. Uh, and I was willing to, whatever the cost, do whatever, do do whatever it took to be successful. And ultimately, I think when we went on training camps, we did more than thirty hours a week. Uh, and and the, the purpose of those are to break you. I think virtually physically and probably psychologically, uh, and. Like ultimately this. you've got a sh short fuse because I, I nearly punched a teammate in the face because um, it's a uh, splash of water on I didn't do it but I thought about doing it and <laughs> the, the coaching staff asked were you going to do it it's like they thought I was going to do it because I, I would look that pissed it's like mm, <laughs> no yeah, uh, it's, not worth, it's not worth it's, that's a little bit petty but you're pushed to that to that breaking point that they only splashed water on me and I lost my I lost my cool. Yeah, no, I stress, stress. Like this is the thing. One of the things I like when you say rowing, one of the things people don't realize is like with rowing, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, it's cardio. It, it like, yes, it is, but like this is the thing. It's one of the nastiest things you can ever do because it's ca cardio and strength over a prolonged um, like set time and you've got to keep on going and keep on going. So it's like, yeah, you're torturing yourself in both ways, strength and cardio. And yeah, being like being sick <laughs> is like half the thing when like, look, I've been on the rowing machine a few times in my life and like, yeah, you're like, you're going at it, you're going, okay, you decide to go hard and it's like, right, after 30 seconds, if you're not ready for it, it's like, kind of, hello, <laughs> this is pain and this is like psychological. We're both going to be nesting up in your head right now for God knows like how long. So I say this from a standpoint of someone who goes to the gym. And like does that and I like, going, okay, after 15 minutes, I'm like going, okay, if someone gives me a gun and if I had the strength to pull the trigger, I would like put myself out of my misery a couple of times. But to do it at an elite level where it's like, okay, yeah, that if you're not really if you're not really giving it your all, <laughs> the next boat is going to like cruise past you. And the worst thing in the world. When if you're watching it on TV, it, it looks ever so easy, but in that boat, what's it like being in that foxhole, being in that boat? <laughs> well, I've been on both ends of that. Uh, I think if we go back to my last season in the sport, yeah, we got left behind at the start because uh, I didn't make the mistake. But uh, and obviously the the psychological aspect of that. When you're left at the start, you're thinking, well, pff, okay. 
it's not going to be a good idea at the office here with last place. Um, but I think because of the, the the crew member I was in, I think they know that they, 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 they know they know they made the mistake. Uh, mm. Somehow that they didn't ha- they didn't get full connection with the water, and ultimately the blade came out and kind of stopped the boat boat dead. Uh, but they were very because they were in the stroke seat, they were in control. They kind of like, well, okay, I've done I've done this. Okay, let's throw caution to the wind. So that thought of of what I've just said of well, it's going to be a crap day at the office. Might as well throw the towel in. That was only there for about five seconds. It's like, okay, we're, we're picking up speed here. And to give some context, uh, our team manager kind of said she'd never seen a crew row through the entire through row through the entire field so quickly. We'd gone from being last at the start to within the space of within two hundred meters being first. And then we walked it. But psychologically, what you talk about, when a crew can't do anything about it, and we've not done it, we've not done it later in the race, we've done it at the beginning, and we've completely annihilated the field. Psychologically, it's happened, but not, not uh, it's happened to me, but not that catastrophically. Mm. Uh, I've had crews obviously go through, come through towards the end, which happens a lot in rowing. Uh, I spoke to one of the the one who was in the men's eight in London. He said if there would have been another 10 metres, they'd have finished fourth, not bronze. Um, and it takes that honesty because they threw the kitchen sink at it from the very get, get-go to kind of uh, get the Germans off their game. Ultimately, it didn't work. But, and it nearly cost them a medal uh, entirely just going for the gold medal. But I think... Uh, when you said, you asked me that in terms of what is it like to be in the boat, mm. it's not very pleasant. That's for, that's for sure because ultimately, the fifteen minutes you talk about, we've got to do it from minute zero. Mm. We've got to do it from the very first stroke to ultimately get the boat up as quickly as possible to as fast as it can be within the space of ten meters. It's got to be that quick, and then you've got to be, be able to try and maintain that. Obviously, the discipline itself has changed because when I competed, it was a thousand meters. Now it's gone up to the Olympic distance of 2000 meters, which is a completely different race. But when I competed, it's gone to tape, you know, very much. If you use the metaphor uh, of the 100 meters, it's balls out all the way. Mm. You're, trying to, you're trying to get to your fastest pace as quickly as possible and then maintain it and ultimately physically and psychologically that's very difficult because ultimately your body's screaming from the inside it's like and the body wants wants to be nothing but to switch off because it's like well you're doing yourself some harm here this is not normal we need to shut off ultimately i've done that in training and i've i have blocked out when we finish training pieces, but I know when I've come ra- come round, only if I like momentary, I blacked out a little bit. It's like, oh gosh, that was hard work. But I think when it comes to the actual competition of a major championship, it goes up another level because you've got that added pressure of stress, anxiety, uh, the internal pressures you put on yourself and I think the external to a certain extent to serve the greater public which I think now as a coach I don't do and I'm not that fussed about it if ultimately if you don't like me oh well if you do okay we'll bring you closer but I think as an athlete I think I made a big deal about it too much it's like why well, must I'm I'm representing a nation mm. I've got to make it more important but I think if I'd have maybe been a bit more uh, stoic as I am now and forgotten about that, I'm probably going to lower the stress a little bit because when I watch back my last competitive final, I look like I've seen a ghost. I look absolutely terrified. And it probably comes down to it. I knew it was going to be the last time representing my country in that sport. And we hadn't had a very good run up to the championship because I was training by myself for probably like two months. Mm. 
mm-hmm. instead of being in the crew boat because of, because of injury. Uh, we're very lucky probably to go because it was kind of 50-50 whether or not the boat would go at all with the injury. Uh, and then we kind of had to work our way through the rounds to get back into form because the, the race I talk about was early in the season. Mm. So we walked it. We were probably one of the crews to beat. And then obviously the injury happens. And it's like we managed to probably get up to some form when it got to the final. But And we went, we won, I think, I think the crew that finished last didn't be, actually beat the world best time. But her family are very naive. It's like, oh, you're breaking the world record. Yeah. It's too late because ultimately four crews have already done it. The world record is a lot, a lot quicker than it was. But it was nice to have probably had a milestone to see the boat. My last race had gone the fastest it had ever gone in the four years that I'd been in the sport. It's like, okay, we've come a long way from uh, the World Championships in 2006 to my my last race being in 2009. Um, but there's a little bit, of, probably a little bit of regret because it's like, well, I think when you, you asked me what would happen being in the boat, well, the crew that won, they caught a massive crab in the race, which is even worse uh, detrimentally than what we'd done at the beginning of doing it at the start it's not really you're not really got very much speed but when you're doing it for pelt and it happens i think if we'd have been a little bit more on song mm. and that two month gap hadn't happened we'd have capitalized and we'd have crucified them so thank you very much now you're gonna have to settle for the silver medal but i think hindsight and after the fact it's quite soul destroying because we were that there or thereabouts like for a bronze anyway and uh because she the the person in question has got a disability where the, the the her hip socket comes out routinely she thought it'd come it come out but it actually popped back in and she asked well i can't carry on um and ultimately i backed off as well because i'm not going to put my back at risk and the boat's not going to any, go any faster uh, with one person pulling harder than the other so obviously we were kind of resigned to well okay there's a medal going well we knew we were we were fifth best crew anyway we were not, that because how rowing works it's luck of the draw so you could be in um well, that crew was in a repechage where it was easier. If they had been in, in, in our one, and I can't remember who finished second, they wouldn't have got in the final at all because it wouldn't have been good enough. Up in, in the easier of the, I'll call them semi-finals, because uh, if ultimately if you won your heat, you went straight to the final. Uh, mm-hmm. We finished second or third in the heats, uh, which was pretty good going, considering we we were lucky to be on the start line and, and we built for the championship we got better and ultimately it was unfortunate what transpired in the final I, I i probably was a little bit spiteful after because it's like well if that doesn't happen i get my medal that what i came came back into the sport to do because ultimately that's why i kind of took up the challenge one last year it's like well let's get this medal and everything that's come before it was all worthwhile but i think speaking to her her partner in in london that happened in in london and in, in the olympic in, in the olympics at mine happened in the world championships not so bad because they happen every year mm. and he was very resentful because they finished fourth I finished fifth, so it's not so bad. Um, and then that individual's gone off to do an individual sport. I was probably not. I'd learned from it and, and, and kind of then went into a team sport of, of volleyball uh, where it's even more difficult because if you can't, you need to have six guys on song every single match to, to, to succeed. Uh, and finishing eighth, as we did, um, yeah, management have put, I'd put, we should finish fifth or sixth. I'm thinking you guys are a bit delusional, mm. but obviously you need to put push the envelope out and kind of push people's ambitions. Yes, if we'd have been together a lot longer and been a little bit more consistent, I think we probably could hit the heights of fifth or sixth. But I thought realistically, when we finished the tournament eighth, we'd done well. We became the first British volleyball team ever to win a match at the Paralympics or Olympics, and that's not going to change because ultimately, 
uh, well, they've disbanded most of the programs anyway. That's not going to happen again. So, but I think what irritated us after the tournament had finished, yeah, the press pray, uh, kind of put us in a bad light. It's like, oh, you guys are a failure because you you finished eighth place, and they put the men's team and the women's team in the same light. The women lost every single get every single match. Mm. We got into the knockout rounds, and we got knocked out by the silver medalist in the end so it's not a bad game okay we lost like four pool games and we won the one that we needed to because we played the moroccans in the world champs in 2010 and lost uh i think because of myself coming living in belgium i learned french Mm. from the age of three so i had a discussion with the master of the tournament and they were making like loads of excuses uh they had a teammate test positive for a banned substance and say oh if we had this teammate we would have beaten you it's like okay one person is not going to make a massive difference we are night and day the team we were at the world championship we'd have battered ourselves two years later because we went we became a professional team that winter training 15 to 18 hours a day most of the athletes some of them did i was i went full-time because i'd made the decision after i'd graduated from university okay i made the right decision in 2008 to go professionally and to train full-time i want to go to london and experience the home games mm. let me give myself a year to see what at least happens i might get binned i didn't i made the team in the end but i gave myself that opportunity to obviously have that that opportunity to 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 at least be a part of the team and be a part of the conversation. Mm. Yeah, no, three things sort of come to mind with regards to like what you've just said because look, uh, going from rowing like in a pair like that sort of team dynamic, then like going okay, right, uh, let me go into a different sport entirely where you've got like a larger team dynamic and like so you've got those two like two things going on but then uh which i find a little bit uh i find it amuses me that you went into a team which never has won anything like not a single game uh to winning a game which is like yeah that's like a hundred percent success compared to previous years and yet that the whole press with like going, ah, you're, you're right. Well, I think that's how our pre- I think that's how the British press is in in general. It's like we'll, we'll we'll praise you, we'll we'll build you up, and we'll tear you a new one, and we'll tear you down just as quickly. Um, so I think if you were to have the legacy, which I think they missed the mark because they're starting to do it now, and I think it's ten years too late. If you'd have done it from there. And you would have done like, I don't know, America football team would do. They would take those press scriptings and put them in the team locker. And players would see that every day. And, and I could feel myself just getting um, a buzz just talking about it. You would see that every single day and you'd be pissed. And you would do something about it. So, okay, I'm going to prove you wrong mm. to make a statement. And ultimately, the powers of B have not done that. If you kept all those guys together for what is now 10 well eight years mm-hmm. we'd be about would we would would the team qualify for rio probably not but tokyo would have been a possibility but it obviously comes down to at that level money uh and this is a disagreement i have with my mom all the time of she thinks obviously the ones that are done the bottom end should get more of the money and the big boys should get less of it mm. yeah, but if the big boys don't have all the money they don't stay at that stage because the likes of sailing, rowing, um, what's one of the top ones, cycling, swimming, they don't stay at the top. They would slip oh. down the pecking order and ultimately the money would go would, 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 uh, lower and lower. So that's how it is. It's based on results and performance. Mm-hmm. It's not a perfect system. And obviously, we've seen it come out with gymnastics, uh, with bullying uh, recently in the press. Uh, I brought that up with other athletes. It's like, well, what's your take on it? Because ultimately, it's a fine line between 
getting the best out of the individual and bullying and sport is in a bubble it doesn't it's not like the rest of society oh and ultimately this is something that's being dictated by society okay this is wrong in society yeah but 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 you can learn a lot from sport be it you know tolerance people being able to work together even though they don't like each other which happens quite a lot in men's sport women's one is probably even more difficult because if they have a domestic it's quite hard for them to they've got to kind of have a grudge for age whereas males could have a punch up and it'd be forgotten about it's like we've got the the tension out the way that problem's been resolved let's go back to work and i think with this bullying come to apparition and my mum mate raised a good point about it they meddled in rio and that's what sport's based on okay it's tactics of of shaming and name calling about people's weight is not right but it's worked and ultimately that's what a sport is going to be judged on that's what the coaches are going to be judged on is have they produced the medals what they said they were going to do and obviously that's a difficult one and i think as athletes ourselves when we talked about it you as an individual if your weight is an issue I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but I'm going to give my point of view. You should want to have that criticism brought to the, okay, this weight is going to make your, hinder your performance. We need to do something about it. Okay, the way in which he did it to belittle somebody and kind of mentally probably abuse somebody Mm. is maybe not right, but I can assure you it probably happens in every sport up and down the country to some degree. Uh, I think I I was asked, uh, well, actually, no, sorry. I was told by a former teammate of mine about the incident in the run-up to Beijing because he said, oh, we think you were almost verbally abused on a daily basis because the coach actually asked the rest of the, the, the squad, am I being too harsh on James? They said, yes, I would disagree. But somebody looking on the outside would probably say that is bullying because I'm being singled out day out, day in and day out as maybe not given my all. But because I'm quite a person that is, I'll use a French word, laissez-faire, is quite relaxed in my approach to a lot of things that I do, mm. it can be taken the wrong way. Thus... I think once I was in his duty of care and he saw me day in, day out, okay, James does care about what he's doing. He, he's putting in the work. And ultimately, I kind of went up through the gears. Um, but ultimately, it does take somebody to do that to me sometimes. Yeah. Because uh, coming back to my performance director in Wales, he likes to say, well, what's James going to turn up today? which is not great when you think of performance, uh, especially at that level. It's like, well, is it going to be the one that is content with just doing enough or is it going to be like a Michael Jordan or or Kobe Bryant? It didn't happen very often, but if it did, you were in trouble because and the only time it happened in rowing, I got irritated because it kind of said to me, oh, we're not, which year was this? It was about 2007, what? Uh, selection for world champs oh we're not picking the team today okay even though you said it's going to be final trials okay and something just clicked inside me i was absolutely furious um the other i think to restart the race got more irritated and I actually had a better start the second time around and I ended up beating the person by over 30 seconds. Come off the water. They say, oh, we're still not going to pick the final selection. Okay. I had to train with him for two weeks, two, say about two to four week period, which was absolutely pointless because uh, the classification will never have two males competing together. It's a mixed sex, uh, mixed gender uh, classification. So it was absolutely pointless for him. Absolutely pointless for me. I 
was probably pulling around the lake for two hours, not really getting anything out of it. I'd have, made, I'd have probably got more out of it training back at home in, in South Wales than, than having to go up to uh, the Reading area where rowing is based. But when it comes to final selection, I think probably a couple of weeks later, the weather was a factor. It was rough. It was windy. It was, oh, well, as a, I'm outside, it's actually nice and sunny now, but it was absolutely crap weather. I trained on that week in, week out. He hadn't. Mm. So I knew I'm going to beat him. So I was like, well, I'm just going to do just, an, I'm just going to go balls out at the start and lead from the front. And once you're in the front, obviously it's very difficult to respond once you're behind and it's just anything that he brought to the table I counteracted and I think I'd be in about five, five seconds and he came from a a, rowing back, uh, a rugby background so they're very amicable uh, when they come off the pitch they'll clap each other win or lose so I had no grudges to him I'm going to respect you as a person and not as a competitor because I thought no point of humiliating him again. I've made a, I made a statement. I've made a point. It still wasn't good enough. I'm just going to beat you. Uh, and then obviously when we fast forward to my last season in the team with a different coach, he said at the very beginning of the season, if you come back, if you beat everybody that I put in front of you, end the story. The door is closed on everybody else and we move on with you. Mm. Um, obviously, that period of time where I was just training by myself, I was obviously doing a lot of mileage. Um, the person that they wanted to bring in to t- t- probably challenge me for the seat, who I'd faced the year before, and who beat me in the double, but not by himself, um, he had to race against the, the cast of facing below. He, he lost to them. And I think my coach probably said, not worth putting him against James because it'd be pointless. Because... James would probably just go through the motions, which I might have done, um, because ultimately you're judged on results. If I beat you, that's it. I've done my part. Whereas he probably did it. Well, James is flying in training. Let's put him against the clock. Nobody likes the clock because mm. ultimately you want to, you want that thing to stop as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, I think I've managed to go under the four minute mark for the k by yeah. myself so i was i was kind of smoking it so he would if if i had a i probably wouldn't have i probably had a 78 percent and, and i was still beaten but i think because they'd only raced over a quarter of the distance and he lost it's like well let's just keep james doing what he's doing it's hard to go against the clock because you've got to psych yourself up to well, i need to get in the zone to virtually put myself through torture for f- four minutes or less mm. or depending on if the weather's completely still possibly longer than that because that's what ro- rowing's one of those brutal ones the weather can dictate how fast the event's going to take it could be if it's tailwind you're going to go faster if it's a headwind it's going to take you a lot longer to do that core uh, and i hated a tailwind i didn't mind it in tr- uh, i hated a headwind sorry I didn't mind it in training because ultimately you're going back the other direction. Whereas in a race, depending on how the, whatever direction the course direction is facing, the finish line is going into a head, headwind. Mm. Okay, today's going to be a hard day, but it's going to be a hard day for everybody. And some crews hated it more than others. Uh, so I, it's more challenging in a tailwind because you've got to be a little bit more... Uh, have more execution because it's got to be on them. Everything's got to be sharper because yeah. you're going that much quicker. So I, 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 I didn't mind if it was when I beat the person by 30 seconds, it was dead still. That's like the easiest conditions uh, to be able to row and you just have to execute everything and, and, and go from there. So it's been, it's been probably uh, like you asked me up and down. Uh, it's been, Obviously, more highs than lows. There's been some low points of being reclassified in swimming. Well, reclassified in rowing. Dropped from swimming. Obviously, leaving the sport of sitting volleyball on my terms because I walked away. But I was going to walk away uh, long before. I think I'd made the decision for what I was going to do for Rio. 
when I was selected, it's like, well, thank you for thank you for kind of getting me to get to London. Yeah. I'm going to jump ship now and look to my next sport. Ultimately, uh, that didn't work out. And I think, no, it's not a regret anymore. But I think after I'd done it, it was, well, you threw in the towel too easily. It's, it's like, why didn't you rise to the challenge again? Ultimately, it was more difficult than it was getting into rowing or, or volleyball. And it probably would have been very much similar to swimming. Swimming was not an e- easy uh, progress. A lot of people said, well, it couldn't be done. Uh, you started too late. Forget about it. Maybe go on to another sport. It's like, no. Mm. I was very naive as a 15-year-old. And I'm not going to be told I can't do anything because I've grown up uh, with a disability. When people said I can't, okay. I'm going to prove you wrong. Okay, that's an axe to grind and, and, a, and, a, and a grudge and a little bit of um, oh, what's the word I want to use? Um, kind of motivate, external motivation to prove somebody wrong, which obviously for people now I would say don't use because obviously it's negative energy because why should it take somebody externally to fuel you ultimately it happened far too many times for my liking because i got complacent or i got lazy mm. in my career and it took uh you know documentaries with the bbc to um live indian servicemen wanted to go to beijing okay that's not happening <laughs> that, that, that 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 was all the motivation i needed at that particular time okay the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere aren't the easiest for any athlete. And they're the te- very testing, especially for, 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 more psychologically than physical, because ultimately you're doing your mileage irrespective of it anyway. And that's where you're doing the, the groundwork for the racing season in the summer. But I think where I probably lost sight of it at the end of my career, was that inner drive that I had at the very beginning. It's like, okay, it's a challenge. How are you going to get over this, this, this obstacle, this wall, as I like to put it? I t- virtually was like, okay, I'm going to turn my back around and I'm going to walk away. I, I deemed it as when people ask, well, why did you retire? They were excu- their excuses now because I talked about the injuries are mounting up uh mentally didn't want to do it anymore mm. no you threw in the towel you 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 didn't want to rise to the challenge so you took the you you took the easy way and you ran away with the tail between your legs it's 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 hard for people to listen to but it's the truth it, it's it was probably because i'd achieved most of the milestones that i set out for myself as a 15 year old, maybe even younger than that, of becoming a professional athlete as I wanted to do as a young child. Mm-hmm. Done that. I've gone to get, I've gone to multiple world championships. I've gone to Europeans. I've done intercontinental championships. I've done the Paralympics. The only thing that was missing was the medal. Mm. So that should have been a, ch- that should have been a challenge because ultimately, James, you still haven't got the pinnacle of what you wanted. So, why don't we go why don't we go again in yeah. in in the, in this new sport but i took the easy route of okay i'm not good enough i'm going to walk away i think ultimately i probably shouldn't have gone to that trials anyway because i was ill and i was injured um and it paid to me getting worse because i had developed sciatica so that uh, anybody that suffered with that pretty bloody pretty painful uh when you're having shooting pains going from your back into your legs so i think in hindsight i probably should have listened to family for once and kind of said now nah, unfortunately i'm gonna have to decline this invitation uh for for selection and ultimately do more work mm-hmm. uh i was probably probably too naive it's like well i've done it before 
I've walked, virtually walked into teams. This is going to be no different. Mm. With British canoeing, it was a different beast. It was people have been training for years, probably years, if not longer. People have been kayakers or canoeists, either been able-bodied and become disabled or had gone into that sport because they enjoyed it. And once it became a Paralympic event, poof, it goes up a level. And because of my naivety, I probably thought, well, I've done, I've done all these accolades in national sports before. But I'll just waltz into this team and kind of, I don't know, probably the ego was probably too, ele- too big, I think, in hindsight. And because, and it was burst pretty quickly. It's like, pff, no, you're not, you're not good enough. What are you going to do? And ultimately, I took the easy walk. I walked away. That was resentful for a long time. It was probably two two years till I actually probably took a hard look at myself in the mirror and thinking, well, this finger pointing needs to stop. Yeah. So what changed over the, like, at that two-year barrier? My podcast. I spoke to a sports psychologist mm-hmm. about some of the issues that I was doing. Uh, by that time, I'd moved, I, I, I was excelling in wheelchair basketball at uh, club level. And there's a lot of things that I wasn't doing. Um, I can't remember what we titled that episode. I think it was dealing with injury mm-hmm. is the t- type of the episode. And every question that I asked to him was respect, res, res, I can't think of the word, um, reflective on me. Mm-hmm. The answers that I needed to hear was to me. So be it, um, what does an athlete do if he thinks he's better than than the team? Okay, that's paraphrase. I don't think I asked that question, but I was asking like A, B, C, D questions. Ultimately, it took me, it took very hard to listen to it back. But when I did, I kind of sat there listening to it okay, James, are you doing Are you doing A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way down to that? No, no, no. What are you going to do about it? Because ultimately, it's not your team. It's not the coach's fault. Mm. It's you. You've got to change. You've got to, you've got to not think I'm the, I'm the big I am because I've gone to the Paralympics. I deserve court time. Once that changed, I probably became a better teammate. It would be, uh, and I think the best answer he gave was if you want to get better you need to ask your coach what do I need to do because it's very difficult to do because you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable state of well I want to be a better version of myself from your eyes looking in to what I'm doing where do I need to make improvements to get obviously more core time um, to be more of an impact towards the team, thus elevating the team. Yeah. And after that conversation, I do it every year. I do it every off season. How can I get better? Ultimate COVID has been a bit, a little bit of a nightmare because I was making massive strides this season. Uh, and ultimately the season was cut bang, right bang, almost towards the end of it for us. Cause I think we only had about, two months left of the season so it's not too bad but I've come a long way as as an individual uh, from that person back in 2016 2017 it's I think even one of the parents said on a, a weekly zoom that we had when we do a quiz just to keep everybody mind occupied and kind of people could see people like they had gone about three months without seeing each other because of no training she didn't know i'd done the paralympics but because i keep that kind of those cards cl- close to guards in my chest mm-hmm. because they're in a different sport i don't want to be judged on rowing swimming or volleyball and just as like canoeing on my basketball because irrespective of where I'm at now, yes, the mindset that I've been able to create can help me over here and help other people. 
but it's not going to get me anything else. It did at the very beginning because we didn't know the team was at the development stage. So my um, exploits were seen as wants to be utilized. The head coach, he's a Paralympian himself. He sought me out on social media. Oh, I see that you live in the town next door to where the team is based. Mm-hmm. What's your thoughts about coming into wheelchair basketball? I did try and do it and try and make London and be uh, do my postgraduate study uh, at the university at Chester University. I kind of had to take a step back. So I know this is not going to work because ultimately I can't be a professional athlete, go to the university and have like a side hustle on the side. <laughs> By all means, when I come home, we'll have a look at it and try it out and see how do I like the sport of wheelchair basketball? Obviously, we're now eight years later. Uh, I've stayed look, I've stayed with the same club for for eight years. I've I've had offers to go play other places, but I've never taken them up uh, to play abroad or things. I, I, w- I wish I had a little bit to, to, to kind of see where I was at, but there's no ill feeling towards the team in terms of that regard. That was my choice. To, I didn't think... I was either good enough to look at it from a pessimistic perspective or ultimately I need to stay loyal. And sometimes I'm probably too loyal to people, um, which can and has been taken advantage of sometimes. And obviously I'll, I'll, I've changed probably from that when people have done it. It's like, okay, I'm not going to take your word for it. I'm going to, ask my perspective on well, what have I done wrong to not get this opportunity. Ultimately, I burnt the, this is something recently I've done. I burnt the bridge myself because uh, they came back pretty annoyed. Well, well, I've done it because you're taking me for a ride and I don't appreciate that. Um, and I'm making my feelings clear that I feel that I've been strung along for over a year let me get the match out yeah and throw it on the on the on the timbers and ultimately i i probably set fire to a relationship but you also take it you made a mockery of yourself but by coming back to the sporting thing i think the willingness to be open-minded and make myself vulnerable in the state that i did by asking well how do i get better yeah he challenged me both physically mentally emotionally we'll chat quite a lot and he'll, he'll ask my opinion because i think because i've uh, le- leveled my mental capacity to take on things on board and be like a a, fe- a senior figure within the team he can kind of say well what's your take on something tactically what do you see that i don't see or what is your take on the opposition? Da, 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 da. And, and I think because it's 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 now a culture that we've created as a team, you don't have to call people out. The players will do it themselves. It's like this isn't good enough. You you are not going. I'll use a, a phrase from Coach Carter, the, the movie, "Pedal to the metal," because we play in tra- of the until COVID happened as if it was a game. Mm. It is full throttle. That's how we play a game. So you need to give everything. And I think because I was willing to become vulnerable, he's obviously seen a different side to me in in training. So I was very much... Those characters that are maybe maybe not as skillful or or, or have the IQ within the sport, They'd have a dogginess about them. Mm. Ultimately, I didn't. But I found that and added that to my game. So it's like I'm like this massive hybrid. I've got all the tool sets. And if I come up with in terms of that dogginess that I had as a young athlete, you're in trouble because ultimately it doesn't take much to annoy me. Be and willingness to take people on and even irrespective of what that club has done beforehand. Okay. I'm not afraid of you. I'm, if you're going to, 
I don't want to curse, but if you want to knock knock the seven shits out of me, I'm going to get up and, and, and keep getting up. You, you, it's going to take a lot to you to get inside of my head. So I like the people that they talk a good game. It's like, yeah. It's like coming back to when I was in school. If I didn't like something somebody said, it's in 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 one ear and out the other. You're just wasting your breath, uh, and ultimately, I can I'll do it to players sometimes. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no. With all the things you've said over the last few minutes, and like I've got to say, yeah, there are many many things will come to mind. Uh, like this is the thing, like like sort of taking it back to sort of bullying and sort of team mentalities. Like I think. People who look at it from the outside can't get it, and people who sort of are in it, can't, they can't really get it. I think the closest and most recent time uh, where it's been sort of a spotlight or looking right behind the curtain has come into play um, is basically, I don't know if you've watched the documentary Save the Last Dance, Michael Jordan. I know. I, I know of it. I've seen. I've seen somebody put a, uh, a kind of a snapshot together. So I, I've kind of seen. I, I saw it as his father was belittling to him. So yeah, I've not. I've never experienced that. I, my family's been very supportive. Yeah. I've had coach that belittle me. Yeah, I've had teachers do it. Ultimately, I've used that as ammunition or fuel. I said, like, okay. Mm. you don't think i'm going to amount to something i can show the i can actually throw the, the internet back in their face it's like this is what i've achieved since yeah. i left school uh, other people uh, classmates uh, have mentioned it on social media gosh you've achieved a lot in in 10 years mm. oh, not, not 10 years sorry it's more than that for since i left school 15 years yeah but i was on the meteoric rise even then uh i wouldn't take like I said throughout the episode, I wouldn't take no for an answer. It's like, mm. okay, it might take a bit longer. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Uh, why, why can't I achieve that? And with regards to like your attitude and the way you're saying that, yeah, like, there is like when you kind of look at and you get the sort of more of this sort of mentality of what Jordan was like at that time, he had pretty much like, look, yeah, this is uh, what I'm out to do is this. Wobatai the fool who comes to this team and doesn't do their job. You come in, you do your job, and if you can't do that, you get the fuck out. That's like, and it was like hardcore. And if you if you saw it, you'd be like, going, "Oh my god, Michael Jordan, you're such a bully. Michael Jordan, you're such like, why are you being so like aggressive? Why are you putting this player down? This, that, the other." And look, when the other teammates they were like, look, yeah, one of the last things you wanted to do was mess up. You, you didn't want to mess up your job. You wanted to make sure you brought it every time. And the players which now sport, like, yeah, championship rings, they will, like, they will definitely turn around to anyone who's like, I'm, but this is like, no, please stop talking. This is what had to be done. This was what was required uh, to get the championship, to get the rings to get the sort of like all of the praise and all of the like rewards which have come to them over the course of time and i just think um i un i understand if people like i don't know the full details of what went on with regards to the bullying and how everything like this but if someone goes yeah my coach put this all this pressure on me but you had a medal at the end of the day I, I, there's part of me which is like going, yeah, they got, they did their job to get you there. They may have not been the nicest people in the world. Yeah, but as you as you know, as you know, that's not their job. They're, they're not there to be your friend. No, they got like they there to get you to be number one on the podium to like get that medal. And if that wasn't what you wanted to do in the first place, then maybe you should have spoke up and went, this isn't for me. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, and stepped away. But that's me. I don't, that's me just saying that from an outsider. And I get that sort of aspect of it. But you know what I mean? Like, 
if I was there and like someone was like, you know what I mean, coming at me like I'm what the fuck, like blah, 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 and like give me all this, maybe I might have been like if it was me, I might have been like, hey, no, this ain't for me. But the whole thing is I've not put myself in the position through my life to be like going, you know what, I'm going to the Olympics. I'm after the gold, if you know what I mean. Um, I haven't gone to like sports and like going, yeah, I want to win the premiership or I haven't like, you know what I mean? Well, I think, I think you're right in, in, in that sentiment. Nobody goes there for, you know, being runner up or bronze medal. Everybody's going there to win. Ultimately it's got to be winners and losers just like life. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously society needs to learn from sport in that sense, because if we're not careful, the PC society that we're creating, you're going to have to walk on such fine of eggshells. Mm. You can't say anything. And it'd be very much like, uh, you know, using Orwell's book, 1984. It's just a different form of big brother Mm. because ultimately you're worried about somebody else's opinion. What are they going to, how are they going to view me? Um, Is it going to impact on my life? Yeah. And ultimately if we're not careful, people are not going to be able to operate because oh, well, I can't say what I'm really going to feel because I'm going to be judged. Mm. That's bad because ultimately, because the truth hurts because people don't want to hear it. Most of the time they're not told the truth even by the, you know, the closest of uh, be it their friends or family. They just tell people what they want to hear. I think probably the most brutish people I've had uh, and my fam- family, they'll tell it. If it they'll tell me like it is. <laughs> um, and sometimes they don't want to hear it. And sometimes I need to hear it. And I mm. think because uh, we are, I think both sides of my family are very stubborn. Sometimes I need to hear it. Um, obviously, I've had, I've had, but I've not mentioned this, but I'll bring it up. I've had issues with mental health. Mm. First person to kind of have a go at me my dad we're not that close but we do speak to each other on the phone at least once a month i think covid's actually brought us closer and we do speak more often Mm. he kind of said to me james why didn't you come to me first and foremost because i do love you and as every parent does they don't want any harm to come of of their son or daughter and we kind of had a very stoic conversation and kind of said well when you leave and I was working in school at that time in education and that's brutal in itself that's probably even harder than sport psychologically because you can't you can't do anything really to the kids anymore there's, 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 they're untouchable virtually uh, which I think is wrong but he was saying well you need to leave everything at school at the front door which I wasn't doing I was taking home their problems mm. uh, and then I'm putting them on top of mine uh, and ultimately, I worked in a very deprived area, so the circumstances are probably even worse. So you're thinking, well, am I making an impact on their lives? Well, I can't really have an impact other than between nine o'clock and three and, and four o'clock, and that's it. Mm. What they do between four o'clock and, and getting up in the morning, I have no bearing on. Um, I think once I was able to have that disconnect, yeah life got a lot easier but i think because he was he was in the count he was in the counseling profession before he retired and he was my dad he told it as theory stuff or this is what you should do Mm. also you need to do this because ultimately you're hurting yourself from the inside um and ultimately i think the only time he was a little bit harsh uh, not as harsh was i didn't do very well with lockdown so my mom said, I'll oh, take it easy on him because ultimately uh, he's in a little bit more emotional, worse emotional state than, than, the, than the previous one, which is, which I've come a long way um, from five, six months ago where I couldn't sit still. Until obviously we've had a conversation over an hour. I mm. could, I, this I could not have done five, six months ago. I, I wouldn't have been able to keep my focus on, on you uh, my train of thought would have been all 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 over the place, and I think when you get in that in that rabbit warren or that rabbit hole, obviously everything becomes about you. Everything ex- external outside of you is 
I won't say it's not important, but it becomes kind of white noise it's, oh oh this is affecting me this way and obviously you bring you you bring anxiety and depression to the fore it's this is that's exactly what he wants it's like well you make a big deal about it mm-hmm. so that's that's the rise and, and be it um and i think once once i did get help as i did and that's very difficult in itself Mm. to to seek it when you, you know there's a problem i think for me because i've done it before because it was different i was offered medication i declined it i probably shouldn't have done that because i was getting slowly slowly worse so i could have actually probably nipped it in the bud probably back in february or march and not nipped it in the bud completely but 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 stopped it in its tracks and kind of be back on, on a on a on a on a positive up curve sooner but because i'd done it holistically two years ago i had in my mind well i'm going to do it the same way again even though all the coping skill coping mechanisms i had to be able to to utilize to my benefit didn't exist gym shut yep class is gone Mm. sport cancelled those are some things i utilized uh even in the beginning when it was starting to take off in china uh, I could see that my mental health was struggling a bit because I was like, well, you're not going to stay home because that's not going to help you. And you're just going to make yourself worse. You need to go You need to go to training and ultimately try and play your way out of it. I probably should have reached out for help then and said, well, I'm, I'm struggling with this. The consumption of social media, I was on Twitter every day last thing at night scrolling down the feed and seeing how bad it's getting in china and then obviously italy so 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 when it does t- when it happens when i kind of get a moment to blip now okay james what are you doing that you can have more control over hmm. scrolling of social media watching all the news be it and if you swipe left on your phone you've got obviously every headline you can think of hmm. I'm trying to make sure I don't do that. If I'm going to go and look at the news, it's so bad anymore because it's got a little bit more. It's calmed down. Over it's the calmed long. down than what it was at the very yeah. beginning. It was very fear mongering and, and, and obviously making, probably made a big deal about the supermarkets and yeah. things like that. But it might have not been as bad as that. But I think it's calmed down a little bit because we've got a little bit more facts. Yeah. If you watch certain shows of like the political ones that are late at night, they've got an agenda. So I try not to watch those because it's pointless because they're not even listening to the other person having a conversation. They just have their own um, whatever agenda that is. I'm just going to badge you and badge you and badge you. So that's what's, what's wrong with that. But in terms of like the, the cons- content that I consume, I have control of that. Uh, obviously, what I eat, I have control of that. So when people say to me, well, I ha- I have no control of how big I've become. Yeah. The industry, the, 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 the McDonald's of the world, the Burger Kings, KFCs, the supermarkets, like the Chris, Chris Isle, or the chips out for the Americans, the biscuits or the cookie yeah. Oh, it's their fault. Yeah. No, but like this. Well, is- but they're not because yeah. ultimately when people have said that and I did a video, a Facebook video on, I coined it the the um, obesity tax. I don't think they call it that, but I obviously did that on purpose because I wanted to pr- pr- create um, debate. Mm. And one of my clients said, well, that's wrong about having obesity attacks. Okay, I can see where you're coming from. Okay, what about cigarette tax? What about tax on alcohol? What about um, the tax that was the most recent one before it with uh, taxing sugary drinks? That's marginalizing different parts of the population each time. This is no different. There will be one after that. And to, to kind of play the victim, when they did say, um, it's not my fault. Okay, well, well, we'll stop you there. 
none of these products are making you put it in your mouth. The, but there's got to be some accountability on the individual. So that does come back, that has come to, down to mindset. And I think because I think that's the, the pro progression I've made with my own mindset as, uh-uh, this is, this is bullshit. I'm, not, I'm going to call this out. This is an excuse. And be it, it was somebody on the news. They said, oh, the company's at fault. No. Mm. Yes, yes, they are marketing to the, the, the weak and the vulnerable. I'm not debating that. But they're not force feeding people to eat it. Mm. You, should, you obviously we need to re-educate people on proper nutrition. Mm. That's got to probably start in school, if not, if not secondary school, primary school, on what does proper nutrition um, look like. Uh, I had a debate with a, te with a teacher of home ec when I was working there. It's like, oh, the eat work play is wonderful. No, it's not. It's for, for 40 years out of date. And it was out of date when I did my uh, personal training course five years ago. Mm. So that's 25 years ago. That's 25, yeah, well, 25 to 30 years out of date. Yeah. When is school going to catch up with something that is... It's it's good to a certain point, but obviously you got to educate people. But and, and a lot of things they were taught to cook were dessert things. Yes, you can survive on cake, but it's not going to do your organs any good in the long run. Yeah. So they need to teach them how to, you know, do the basics. How do you use? Yeah. And and these are these are these were year eleven students. I couldn't use an oven. Couldn't use the hob. That's pretty bad for a sixteen-year-old. I can't do. It. I, I could. I. I. I was shown how to do it at home, and I was probably lazy. I don't need to know. I don't need to know how to do that. It's always going to be somebody to take care of me. Once I moved away, and tried to make the. Would have been team by then. Uh, the Commonwealth in Melbourne in 2006. I obviously moved, um, and I've gone to university in, in in the in the in the autumn anyway. So I spent my summer holidays in in Swansea in preparation. So I had to learn how to cook, learn how to shop, how to clean. Mm. Nobody had to say that. Ultimately, I learned how to do it. the cleaning one, not so well. But <laughs> obviously, the shopping I had to learn. To, I I I I followed my mom around when she'd done the weekly shop. So I know, I know what I need to eat and know what, what, I know what's good and bad uh, and things like that. I didn't know how to use an oven. I didn't know how to use the grill. I didn't use learned because ultimately I either learn how to do it or I starve. That's an extreme. But I think because it takes being put in that kind of extreme situation for people to change, obviously COVID is another one. Or the pandemic as a whole, when we were in lockdown, people were exercising. They didn't think twice about it. I want to get out of my house to get away from the four walls. I've seen through looking at social media, that's fallen from being number one priority to like, I don't know, five, six, seven, at worst case, probably like number 10. Mm. And ultimately, the government itself weren't doing. You could see where the priorities were. A lot of it was money oriented, you know, up in the pubs, uh, before the, the gym. Oh, obviously, my, my industry is going to be very um, opinionated on that anyway, because that's how we operate. We're all about health and well being. We're obviously going to kind of call that out. It's like, well, that's a bit stupid in terms of you were, all, you were predicating on health. Well, why has why that changed? But I think as people have gone back, the priorities have changed. So health is no longer number one because, you know, childcare, work, making enough money. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'll put that to the back burner again. It's not, it's not a priority. Yeah. It's, it's not a choice. It's a priority. So when people say to me, I haven't got the time to do this for my health or, or well-being, no, no, it's not that you haven't got the time. It's like you don't prioritize it. Mm. 
it's right. not their priority and like this is the thing with regards to health and well-being it's not like okay covid might be calming down right now but covid hasn't actually gone away it's not something which is in the annals of history where like ah oh, remember back in 2020 when there was this covid uh virus the pandemic and it was taking out people of like basically who had pre-existing conditions and like had a certain like overweight and a certain lifestyle and stuff like this oh you remember those good old days yes um yeah it's august and this year ain't done yet so uh, it's the height of summer and we don't know what it's going to be like come autumn uh, or come the winter is it going to be something which is more prevalent or is it going to go all the way up again because yeah we, like more people are now going back to work and stuff like this look people like the government sort of priorities with regards to with regards to the virus yes it started out as health and basically when like every, all the projections were coming in this is what's going to happen to the economy and how is it going to happen they were like it was meant to be something for six weeks and we're meant to be back this is now rolled on to month five and it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon look i've been put on furlough uh for like this period of time come set like come the end of september well come september am i in the job still or am i not uh, who knows but health and well-being has not been the sort of main focus even though it's you know who is it who is it targeting and you know who it's affecting but sort of like going okay look population needs to eat healthier population needs to go out and do more exercise the population needs to like look at some real uncomfortable truths about itself no you don't hear that you may have heard it for maybe one day where like that like johnson was like oh, yeah you know what yeah it was because of my weight. That's the reason why I was taken down by COVID. But you don't hear that anymore. Like, yeah, you mentioned people going out running and working out and stuff like this. You don't see as many people out there as much. Like gyms are back open. Um, I don't see I don't see gym memberships going up all of a sudden or like the mass return. Like it's one of the things. There are certain things with, like, in today's society, we need to take responsibility for. And we can't put that on anyone else. One, and one of the major things, is health. Like, health, well-being, your fitness. And, like, look, I know, I know it can be incredibly hard if it, you've got parents and stuff like that. Like, if you're a parent, you've got small kids and stuff like this. You're going to have to make the effort somehow because if you don't, time will come around and when that time does come around if you not as fit as you should be yeah you're gonna pay the price if you feel like yeah that ain't gonna to happen to me there are a few hundred thousand people who are no longer with us who have paid that price and covid's not over yet and avoid paying that price by like stick getting that a little bit healthier Eat, like eating that less fatty food and look i may have consumed a number of canned drinks here but it's all like pepsi max there's no sugar in it like you know what i mean so it's not ideal but it's still one of these things you've got to pay attention to like all the time yeah uh, that's just me i <laughs> like i could rabbit on for ages but like yes um one like one quick thing if i had the power being the cosmic entity of how can i say positivity hope justice and vengeance no <laughs> <laughs> and i could grant you one wish what would that be oh gosh that's a very 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 difficult question meanwhile oh one wish one wish no I think it, I, I think my one wish would be would one person to enact what we've been speaking about today is, is to take action and obviously be proactive 
uh, and uh, even if their life's not on the road that they want, well, you can change that. And ultimately, it it, it takes uh, persistence. It takes a willingness to get uncomfortable mm. and to do it anyway. Um, obviously, it's I I, I talk of it a good game is it's easier than it's than it is to do but i can i can definitely attest to to that that it'd be worthwhile doing it because of the benefits of it It doesn't have to be the gym it doesn't have to be the run just just get started and yes the road at the very beginning is not going to be easy but i think at the end of the day you'll reap the rewards because if you you feel better about yourself and you're getting compliments from other people, it motivates you to continue on. And ultimately you can't, you, you can't beat way. Cause I know, I know we've said I was humble at the very beginning, but when you have people singing your praise, you like it, you love it. And obviously that's, then reflect reflection on yourself. You'll start speaking more positive about yourself, because obviously I use a, a tagline from my my podcast: "Success breeds success." Nice, nice. Ah, on this happy note and sad note, that like, would you be able to tell the lovely people out there how they can find you? Okay, you can find me on Facebook. Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, if you put the prefix of, of, of any of those social medias and then put J, uh, James O. Roberts, that's J-A-M-E-S, the letter O-R-O-B-E-R-T-S and the number 11. Uh, so you can find me on social media. And if you wanted to listen to my podcast, The Mindset Athlete, you can find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Superb. What I'll also do, I'll put all of these details in the notes below, the episode notes, so they can find you, get in contact. Yes, uh, enjoy your podcast and then some. I've got to say this to you, James. James, I, yes. All I've got to simply say is you're on my radar now. You're not going to get away. I look forward to doing this again in the future. Like, yes. And yeah, uh, please check out his page, check out his like podcast, check him out entirely. But yeah, thank you very much for your time today, James. I'd like to say thank you to anyone who's watching right now. Uh, please stay safe, my friends, my life warriors. Uh, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day. Oh yeah. Peace. <laughs> and we are...